Thank you, Nora. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Bonnie, for inviting me. Uh, I think that we've rehearsed this for about 10 years. Okay. Uh, it really is in memory of Barry that we do these things. And I hope that it helps some of you. I don't know what your background is. For a simple introduction, though, is anybody going through transplantation, having families in transplantation, intimately involved in transplantation? Okay. And again, if you want to ask more detailed questions about the science, and this, I'll be around afterwards, okay? It's my intention, really, to only spend 15 minutes. Uh, I want to leave the time for Bonnie, and I want to be able to participate on how patients and uh, doctors and their spouses um, bond and how we get through something which doesn't have a right answer oftentimes, okay? It's dramatic, it's exciting. I'm gonna to try to tell you a little bit about what's new and cutting edge. So um, I'm presenting really on behalf of a program that has uh, 12 doctors, and uh, this year we'll, we'll actually perform 550 uh, bone marrow transplants. And the program has increased by 7% per year, and we just projected uh, 700 in 2019. And uh, it's, um, it's cell therapy, so, um, I'm sure everybody knows who Sid Mukherjee is by now, right? Uh, Emperor of all maladies. Um, he's a friend of mine. We're going to be in um, Florida, different location, for a talk next month. And, and his talk title is The Future of Cancer Therapy is Cellular. So that's true. And so let's talk about um, cellular therapies. Why is it not advancing? OK, it is advancing. Sorry, I jumped ahead. OK. Um, this is, so I have 12 slides, okay? For me, that's like nothing. And, um, but these are simple conceptual slides, not meant to be science laden. Each one of them we could talk for an hour about, but let's start with this one. This is, uh, to me, a very important slide. In uh, 50 years of uh, cancer therapy, we focused on killing the cancer, um, squeezing the snot out of it, um, giving chemotherapy, giving what is really a anti-metabolite, uh, it's a poison frequently. And um, these therapies are really targeting uh, the cancer with no intention to improve the immune system of the patient. In fact, we make it much worse, right? They actually get more sick and more infections. And so uh, that is uh, also how we do uh, high dose chemotherapy with stem cell rescue, something called auto transplants. That's simply using high doses of chemo. It has nothing to do, with, it's not intellectually interesting. It's effective in lymphomas and in uh, mono, in um, myeloid. Um, multiple myeloma. Uh, along came monoclonal antibodies, uh, rituximab in 1995, FDA approved in 1998, one of the most expensive drugs, biggest profit for Roche and our friends Genentech down the street. Herceptin, very important drug. Uh, other targeted monoclonal antibodies. But it's important to realize, while that's an immune therapy, you put it in on day one and half of it is there on day 20 and half of it again afterwards. You, you place this uh, immune uh, therapy in and it, it, it doesn't propagate, it doesn't proliferate, it, it goes away way. Um, drugs uh, can be brought to the scene of the crime. Uh, a um, vincristin-like molecule can be brought to patients with Hodgkin's disease using a monoclonal antibody like brentuximab. And, um, and then more recently, we're trying to, and I would not want to put the checkpoint inhibitor again, but we're trying to treat the cancer and uh, knock down any of this uh, uh, any of the um, uh, chemistry, any of the uh, signals on the cell surface that are making the immune responses uh, uh, senescent. We want to make the immune cells actually, we want to make the cancer cells look more immunogenic. And so PDL1 is a different drug than PD1. You say, really? Because it sounds the same. Uh, program Death Ligand, I mean, it's a great name, right? PDL1, again, made by Roche up the street, uh, FDA approved in the treatment of urogenital cancers. Uh, and getting a lot of um, interest right now on how to improve immune responses in cancers using CAR therapies. Uh, but that's different than what you're hearing about on television, nevolubumab and um, Pembro as molecules that inhibit uh, program death one on the actual immune cells. And so that appears in the next column where we're targeting the host, the immune responses in the host. So, you know, we've been around for, I'm sorry, I'm on service, so I... I'll turn this off, but uh, we've been uh, vaccinating people since uh, Dr. Jenner and smallpox, and uh, we uh, uh, this year didn't have a good year on vaccines. Uh, the influenza was kind of a strikeout. But uh, Prevnar and diphtheria, tetanus, uh, hepatitis, these are important vaccines, and we can do some of the same work in 
uh, preventing cancers, uh, uh, HPV, um, young women and men who have uh, cervical cancer in women and men who transmit this, and it's important to vaccinate our young people that will have a good outcome to prevent cancer. Uh, and we can modulate immune responses and modulating the immune response, not killing the cancer. Everybody thinks with multiple myeloma they're taking Revlimid because it's killing the cancer. No, it's actually changing the local environment and making the patient's cancer uh, far more immunogenic and the patient's own immune system is getting rid of it. Uh, I just talked about checkpoint inhibitors, so I won't repeat it, but again, uh, taking the brakes off the T cell, removing signal two, and this is having clinical benefits. I, I hope it's curing people too. Clinical benefits, and uh, it is certainly a tool that we'll use in combination. But what I really want to talk about is you take column one and column two and you put them together, right? So uh, the way that we do this the most uh, and the, for the longest has been allogeneic transplant. But the thing I spend most of my time on as the director of the cancer cell therapy program is bringing these new therapies called chimeric antigen receptor therapies forward. And so uh, again, people say, you know, are these here for real? You probably heard about the one in childhood ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It's called uh, Kimraya. It's made by Novartis, got approved during the summer. Um, and then this fall, uh, Kite and Al Gilead uh, got an approval of a drug called Yescarta. Yescarta is a CAR T cell targeting CD19, and it's being used in diffuse large cell lymphoma. Um, you may think that these are, so it took me uh, two years to treat the first six patients on a clinical trial, two years. Mm -hmm. It took me uh, another uh, year to treat the next 10. And then since Christmas, with commercial available drug, we have uh, purchased, purchased now, uh, 10 of these products, infused six of them already, uh, and it's only 30 days. So um, about six months ago, I went to the hospital and said, I think we're going to have a need. Uh, and I said, they said, how much? And I said, well, I think 50 maybe this year patients. And now I'm saying, I think we're underestimating that number, and, uh, and it's uh, to help people. Now, I'm not going to talk about CAR-T tonight. That's not my purpose. I'm going to talk about allo transplantation. We'll come back another time if you want to hear about CAR-T. I think it's a, an exciting thing. And uh, so let's go to uh, transplant. Uh, transplant is, again, uh, important because people often confuse the difference between high-dose chemotherapy with stem cell rescue versus what is an immune therapy allogeneic transplant. Allogeneic means somebody else's immune system dropped into your body and then immunologically uh, going to see the blood system of the new host as foreign and destroy it. But because you brought seeds, hematopoietic stem cells along with you, you'll regrow the blood system in the new host. And this is um, old school, uh, 1968 and, and forward. Auto uh, is half of the uh, types of treatments done at Stanford and is very important therapy for patients who have multiple myeloma or frequently diffuse large cell lymphoma responding to chemotherapy. If a little chemo is good, more chemo is better. The intensity of an auto transplant is 40-fold more chemotherapy than what you got if you're in the clinic getting our chop. And so 40 folds a lot. It has risks. It has toxicities. Um, it's been effective, uh, but it's about to be replaced by CAR therapy. Allo transplant, you combine chemotherapy, but it's really depending on the immune response. It has problems. You have to rebuild an immune system in what it might be a 60 year old individual. Uh, an immune system has no shortcut. You uh, mothers carried the baby in your wombs. They started making immune systems at nine weeks gestation. They had six months of protection before they were born into this dirty world where you got passed around to Uncle Harry and taken to the bar. And if you were a child for the first six months, you uh, had a fever, you went to the neonatal ICU, got IV antibiotics and got a lumbar puncture. And I don't have to explain to anybody why we do that. You all say, well, of course, stupid, it's a baby. But our patients who go through a transplant have the same exact problem, and they don't have the six-month uh, protected time in the womb. Uh, they come right out of our hospital, and they're in this dirty world, and you see them wearing masks, uh, washing their hands, and trying to stay away from the problems. And remember, those child children grew up and went to kindergarten and had one snotty nose after another for the next uh, nine months. The only thing they actually learned in kindergarten, besides coloring inside the lines, was their immune systems. And so... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge. And you could go through that entire process and still have relapse. And that would be the real booby prize of what happens going through transplant. So I, I like this curve. This is an exciting uh, curve that uh, really shows the history of transplantation. At Johns Hopkins, there was an individual. 
uh, following radiation, who uh, was, uh, and remember, in 1959, there were like nuclear submarines off the coast of Vietnam, and, and the Department of Navy was very interested in how we're going to um, manage after the big one drops. And so everybody was very interested in uh, allergenic transplant scientifically. And um, again, uh, at, again, Hopkins, um, 19 patients went through a trial where nobody survived, and the 20th patient signed up. Can you imagine that consent session, right? Um, how did the first 19 do? And you're like, eh. Uh, but uh, it worked in 1968. And then uh, four years later, 1972, unrelated donor in New York City, uh, fortunately an Irishman, because Irish are very, I'm Irish, very inbred. Uh, so, uh, you know, they only had to actually test 4,000 uh, possible donors by the then available technology. 4,000. Um, things have come a long way. Allogenic transplant, though, uh, is really not off the axis, right? I mean, really not much is happening here for um, until you got into the 90s. And so uh, Fred Hutch, uh, Minnesota, these were doing these transplants, but they were doing one or two. At Stanford, we started in 1987. We did a transplant in pediatrics. 98 went by. <laughs> 89, we did two. Okay, so when I look at my own CAR T, I'm like, we're way ahead of how allo transplants started at Stanford. Um, and so now we're at 5,000. And, uh, and as I said to you, 550, and it's increasing all the time. And it's estimated that 10,000 patients will have an allogeneic transplant this year. So these problems are, I wish I could tell you there's a better solution to it, okay? Uh, immunologically, uh, this is the only therapy for the myeloid cancers, the leukemias, the MDSs. The lymphoid cancers actually are getting some new drugs, that's exciting, abrutinib, venatoclax, uh, some of the uh, new targeted therapies, and some of the CAR T cells. So I see a lot on the horizon for the lymphoid neoplasia uh, problems, but the myeloid cancers, I think that the allogenic transplants are going to be here for a while. Now, um, again, uh, this is uh, a, a therapy that historically has been done with histocompatible uh, siblings. Histocompatibility, I could, we could talk about HLA and major histocompatibility all day, or we could just simply say one fourth of your brothers and sisters by chance are matched at the MHC, and they may not be matched at everything else. For example, you may be uh, a, a male, and your sister may be your donor. Now, I can tell you the male and female are different. And for example, the female immune system's never seen a Y chromosome, and it sees it all over the body, and those Y chromosome molecules look different, and the female immune system reacts a lot to it. And it's kind of a simple example of what is a minor histocompatibility antigen. Um, but in essence, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to bring adoptive immunological immune cells, B cells, T cells, they see what is foreign. They have very polymorphic receptors, and the, and the repertoire is, uh, this is a Carl Sagan moment, moment, it's very large, it's billions and billions, right? So it's, uh, it's about 10 to the 12th, that's billions to the millions. And um, that means every little T cell that's floating through your body is actually designed to see something different, everything that's not you. And, uh, and that's just really crazy. Um, I love the immune system, right? I mean, we actually survived for the first, <laughs> heck, we're doing better before we started making antibiotics and industrialization in the 20th century. So, um, you know, uh, while we were running around and uh, just simply relying on our immune systems uh, and not making uh, weapons and other problems, uh, we were doing better. Now, we will survive the virus from Mars. We will survive Ebola. We will survive HIV as a species because of immunity being such a diverse repertoire. It's an amazing system. But it also means that doing what we're about to say, transferring an immune system into a, a recipient and, and some magical immune response is going to cure the cancer is really a challenge, figuring out which one it is. Um, there's this other boogaboo of what happens after transplant. That is that the donor's uh, lymphocytes are going to see normal tissues in the body. The skin, the gut, the liver is foreign and cause graft versus host disease. And if it weren't for graft versus host disease, everybody would want an allogeneic transplant because highly effective. Relapse risks are in the range of 10 to 15 percent after an allogeneic transplant in patients who have myeloid and uh, lymphoid diseases. But the problems of rebuilding immune system, avoiding infections, avoiding the problems of repetitive infections, then driving the donor's immune response in your lungs, your gut, uh, and that driven immune response is then going to see your gut, lung, skin, 
body foreign, causing graft versus host disease, an inflammatory cascade. So I have this really cool little uh, picture of this. So uh, I like uh, that people do solid organ transplantation. Maybe I'll need one someday. But um, it's a relatively simple thing to ask for compared to actually putting somebody else's immune system in your body. So here's the picture, right? You put the kidney in, and uh, now the established immune system of that recipient sees the kidney as foreign. What about the opposite, right? What about you transplant uh, the immune system and it sees the whole body as foreign and then you have to regrow it, right? And it's intercalating through your gut, your skin, your liver. And so um, don't mean to belittle the transplanters of organs. They're very important things to do. But um, growing an immune system after an allergenic transplant is a big problem. And then these problems uh, are things that we learn about over time. Um, you saw the first curve showing that uh, we really didn't do large numbers of transplants until uh, 1985. And really, um, thousands weren't being done until 2000. And so uh, if you ask what happens 10 years after transplant, we really didn't learn that until about 2006. I mean, so the problems of chronic diseases, of transplantation, were something that was coming on late. So initially, we used to talk about the problems of this inflammatory cascade of acute GVHD being in the first 100 days. But now we realize that uh, it's an overlapping cascade of um, acute is simply the T cells that were in the bag seeing the recipient as foreign. But the chronic problem is the seeds that we grew the new lymphocytes from. They don't actually start to make new lymphocytes until three months after the transplant. They get educated in the thymus. They go to the tissues. They're getting inflamed. And this problem of chronic GVHD shows up nine to 12 months later. It's the thing that I've been focusing my efforts on. And you know we have all kinds of names for this. But um, it's amazingly complicated. And this, of course, is the bugaboo, that you end up with uh, red inflammatory changes and the white being the sclerosis, the loss of the normal nail beds, the hair and the mouth sores and the, this looks like it's bubbly and, uh, and like, um, uh, like these blisters, but no, these are solid, uh, really sclerotic uh, and uh, thickened skin changes. So the problem of chronic GVHD is much like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, uh, Sjogren's disease, autoimmune diseases, and you get a lot of them and everybody's is different. And you say, well, which T cell did it, and I'll say all of them, but I don't know which one. So I put one data slide on because I think this is incredibly elegant and I think it's incredibly powerful. The immune response of the donor is both good and bad. It cures the cancer, but it also can cause this graft versus host disease that you're now all experts about. And so this is the simplest way to show that difference. Uh, on the y-axis is the uh, frequency with which the patients who had chronic leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, and this is old data, 1990. This is a classic, as they say. Uh, chronic myeloid leukemia that would recur after transplant it happened all the time if you used an HLA identical syngenetic twin. There's nothing different about it, okay? There's no immunity. So immune, you know, it's going to happen. And if you take those T lymphocytes out of the body, out of the graft, before you put the seeds in, well, you're never going to transfer the immune response. So they won't have GVHD, but they'll not cure their cancer. So it's not that easy. And then showing you that when you elicit the immune response of both acute and chronic or acute and chronic, that you actually have less risk of the cancer coming back. The immune response is working. So this is the yin and the yang, the good and the bad. And this is uh, really the problems of complications. So in, in chemotherapy, it's all about the poison. And you know when we give poison, sometimes you also have infectious complications. But with an allogeneic transplant, it's more complicated. You have toxicity from the way that we got the cells in, the infectious complications, the uh, difficulty of growing the blood and making normal blood counts and graft versus host disease, and I kind of forgot the most important one, you can still have relapse. So um, not a simple thing to do. Now, I got two slides to say what I learned after 15 years of not learning this, okay? Um, it turns out it's all about the patient. That's why I'm here. So uh, you can do these life-saving uh, you know, life therapies, but if you didn't help the patient get through it, and some of this is quite traumatic and really has... You know, I have plenty of patients who feel like they have PTSD from being in the hospital room and being locked down and going through therapies. Um, quality of life is very important, and if you have a problem like chronic GVHD, it's, every, it's very different for everybody. Some people may have mouth sores, some people have skin, some people can't walk, some people have contractures, some people can't breathe well. So it's very different. And um, most importantly, physicians underestimate this. You know, we walk in and we say, oh, the blood counts are good. You're alive. We don't listen. We're hurried. 
So um, it took me a while to figure this out, about 25 years. Um, and so I really, I hope, um, you know, Bonnie will say a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. But what we did together was we shared the experience. And um, she wrote a book about it, heck. Uh, and, you know, you have to educate the patient. You have to have them tell you what is bothering them. You have to spend time with the patient. It takes half hour in clinic. There's no shortcut. Um, there is a, a real commitment uh, in this relationship. And Bonnie will tell you that when my patients, uh, I give my card out, it has my cell phone. I mean, if you are sick, I don't want to hear about it after you're really sick. I need to hear you right away. And you're watching my cell phone beep. Um, you, you need to make these decisions based on not on what you want, you can offer opportunities, but on what the patient wants. And ultimately, there's going to be some tough decisions because, um, you know, quality of life, the, the well-being, the psychological issues, spiritual well-being, what the patient expected, the family distress, the social support. The most important member of my team is my social worker, I swear to God. Uh, what she has to help us with uh, as families go through spending uh, themselves into poverty, as they go through uh, you know, the donut holes and the, the problems of supplement uh, Medicare D and um, Medi-Cal. So you know, these are hard decisions. Um, it's getting better all the time. And, and I want to say this very clearly. For 20 years, I didn't see a lot of change. In the last five years, cancer therapy is exploding. And in the last two years, I get out of bed in the morning and you can't keep me at home, okay? Because um, there's so many new therapies and so many great ways to help people. And, you know, as I say to my colleagues, uh, you don't choose your patients. Your patients choose you. Uh, these patients become your friends, and unfortunately, half of my friends die. So you have to figure out how to deal with that, right? I mean, you have to have a partnership, and you have to have meaning in what it is you do. And likewise, I think that the patients have to uh, help really guide this path. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to let Bonnie take over. evening. Thanks for having me and letting me follow David Miklos. <laughs> I'd like to start by telling you my story. Barry and I were married in 1968. Barry was a trial lawyer and I was a librarian, so it's lovely to be here in this space. <laughs> in July 2005, after 37 years of marriage, Barry was diagnosed with CLL, chronic lymphocytic le leukemia. <clears throat> Things started to move fast with treatment decisions, health crises, two stem cell transplants, and a changing marriage. He the patient and me the caregiver. We started treatment at CPMC in San Francisco, but after almost a year of false starts, incorrect diagnoses, and useless treatments, we thankfully moved to Stanford. From the beginning, we both felt compelled to write about our experience from our different points of view, and I'm hoping that is helpful to all of you in your different roles. Barry had been writing for years. He had a website and began to post what he called transplant stories. I began to write mass emails to my large network of friends and family. I wrote as a way to process what was happening and also as a way to avoid painful phone conversations. In 2011, after his second transplant and after my retirement, he suggested that we put our writings together in a book. His journal entries, my emails, interspersed with narrative. He was the driving force behind the book and guided me in the writing process. Now I'd like to read you some selections from Dancing with Cancer, Maladies and Miracles in Stem Cell Transplant Land, because it will give you a sense of our, experience, our experiences as caregiver and patient. This is Barry's voice from the introduction. When I was first diagnosed with leukemia, I felt an ominous foreboding. I'd had a brush with prostate cancer four years earlier and confided to Bonnie during some emotionally charged pillow talk that even when first diagnosed, I was confident I'd beat the prostate cancer, but this leukemia was gonna get me. I was depressed and angry. Bonnie was in denial. But when I caught my breath, I realized that what I had was all I had, and I could either make the most of it or throw the rest of my life away. While no one likes to hear that they are going to die, 
a lot of us get that information before we do die, and I am convinced that most of us can take it. I believe that learning that death is rapidly approaching, as opposed to being an, an, as opposed to being an eventuality, can be liberating. Many of us want the time to prepare, to say our goodbyes, to complete unfinished business. Before I got cancer, I used to be a whitewater kayaker. One of the things I noticed was how instinctively better women were at it than men. Men had a tendency to try to muscle their way down a river, while women danced along looking for a path. I watched men's muscles give out, saw them getting tired, stiff, klutzy, and inept while the river never quit, quit flowing. Meanwhile, the women maintained grace. Finding the paths where you could dance along seemed to work better than raw muscle power. Barry wrote this piece after our first meeting with Dr. Miklos. I'm a car salesman, Dr. Miklos says. This is just an informational interview. I'm hoping that maybe I won't need a transplant. Maybe Campath has done the trick. I'll listen politely, but I'm not in the market for a car or a new brand of blood. I don't like salesmen, car salesmen especially, so he's chosen the wrong metaphor for my sensibilities. But maybe the camp path has worked, I suggest hesitantly. Maybe I don't need a transplant. Dr. Miklos shakes his head. Camp path gets you into remission. It doesn't keep you there. Sooner or later, the CLL will come back. And when it does, camp path won't work as well the second time. The only way to get cured is to have a transplant. Bonnie had been researching transplants. Isn't a transplant dangerous? I've heard that they have high, they're high risk. Dr. Miklos is pulling no punches. Right now, about 5% of those receiving a transplant die during the first few months. A transplant used to, requi used to require that we wipe out your Im entire immune system, but we've gotten better at it. Now it's not a total ablative procedure, so the risk is lower. But yes, there is a significant risk of death. And after the treatment is over, there is also a risk of GVHD, graft versus host disease. That is where your body tries to reject the graft. graft. GVHD can cause lots of bad side effects that can be chronic for the rest of your life, and GVHD can also kill you. But it's the only route we presently have to, complete, to a complete cure. If it works, you will have an entirely new blood system. I look at Bonnie with a long face. I thought that the camp path could be a cure now. Now I'm being told that the automotive repair is only a stopgap measure. I may get a few thousand miles more out of the old machine, but I'm going to need a new engine pretty soon. We might as well get that ball rolling soon, Dr. Miklos suggests. It could take a while to find somebody who is suitable, and you don't have to make a decision right away. He then launches into an explanation of the transplant process. The big words are flying, as you heard. <laughs> The references to the other transplant centers, Hutchinson, MD Anderson, Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, their success and failure statistics go in one ear and out the other. Bonnie takes notes. I do my usual tune out thing. What I retain is that 5% die right off the bat, and of those who make it through, a bunch get GVHD, and some of them croak. Another group ends up having to take steroids for the rest of their lives. After the meeting, we are cruising along Interstate 280, heading north to home. To our left, the pristine watershed for San Francisco. Long, thin lakes of shimmering turquoise fill the valley created by the San Andreas Fault. Beyond the lakes, a ridgeline of evergreens cuts a saw blade horizon into the clear blue summer sky. I want to live to see more of these afternoons, more such scenery that, until recently, I have taken for granted. I thought that the camp path would do it, I say sol solemnly to Bonnie. Me too, she says. You know, if you do the transplant, we'll have to move to Palo Alto to be near the treatment center. I'll have to take a leave from my job. They say that patients need a caregiver 24-7. It will change our lives even more than it has already. During the rest of the trip home, we were lost in thought, imagining how our lives are going to be different, perhaps permanently. And I might not make it. How long will I be OK with just the camp path, I ask myself? And what if a transplant does not cure me? What if I have two years now the way I am? What if I get a transplant next month and die? I've just tossed away two years. I repeat these thoughts aloud. What if we get hit by a truck in 10 minutes, Bonnie replies. 
Here's a piece I wrote uh, right after his first transplant. Being a full-time caregiver is kind of like having your first baby. Barry sleeps a lot. He is in no position to make decisions and has abdicated that responsibility to me. I am constantly busy, exhausted, somewhat worried, and accomplishing nothing. I am, however, truly grateful that I can do this for him. And here's another piece by Barry. This was written in uh, early 2010. Barry was losing his graft, and Dr. Miklos said he wanted to try a boost with his donor's cells. My donor, Jennifer, has been a real blessing, and we've had a fulfilling email exchange since approximately a year after my transplant, when the powers that be allowed us to learn, to learn each other's true identities. I hated to impose, but Doc Miklos said that the DLI boost required another donation from her. So they called her up and asked. She told them that of course she would help, but wasn't there some rule they had that donors couldn't be pregnant? Yes, they said, and she said something like, well, you just caught me in the nick of time. My husband and I were planning to start trying next month. Incredibly, she volunteered to hold off until after another donation of stem cells, which happened the second week of January 2010. And I'm pleased to say that she has two healthy little boys and was due with her third child last month. And here's another short piece by me. As I've said before, this has been a lot harder than I ever expected and has not gone according to plan. Dr. Miklos warned us that things happen, but of course we thought we would be different and Barry would just sail through. Denial is very strong and helpful and has served me well, but it just doesn't always work. And although today was not scary, life-threatening, or painful for him, it was exhausting, draining, and things we planned didn't happen. It will take me a lifetime to adjust to plans not happening. Barry died February 1st, 2014, eight and a half years after his diagnosis. Not all of that time was difficult. We had many rich experiences and a lot of quality of life. The hardest and most rewarding time in my marriage was caregiving for Barry. It was a time for a different kind of intimacy and love. I'd like to add a few words about caregivers and how, if there are any of you in the audience, uh, how you might take care of yourselves. Advocacy. No one knows the patient like you do. And it's important to communicate your observations to the doctors and nurses. You are one of the expect experts in this whole experience. In my time here at Stanford, I found that you will get honest responses and lots of time and caring as long as you ask for it. And that's what David was talking about, the partnership. Support. It's important for family and friends to show up, and many don't know how. Unfortunately, you might have to teach them by directly asking for it, like cooking meals with, of course, all the dietary rules and restrictions, giving you respite by coming and hanging out with the, with the patient, shopping for groceries or whatever else you might need, or just listening when you need to talk or cry. Self-care. There's been a lot written about this, and depending on the circumstances, Perhaps not a lot of time to do self-care. In retrospect, my emails were the best way for me to take care of myself. It's important to find ways to communicate with close family members, especially adult children, that work for you, whether it's phone calls, texts, emails, or sites like CaringBridge, do what makes you comfortable. It's also important to ask for what you need from the healthcare professionals. What would you make your life easier? Support groups, informal ways to connect with other caregivers? And now I'd like to read my afterword. There were many things we both learned during the eight and a half years between Barry's diagnosis and his death. One, doctors and nurses are not our priority. The patient is our priority. It is really important to speak up if you think something is wrong, either with someone's treatment of you, like a nurse being rude, unfeeling, or incompetent, a doctor who is miscommunicating, or in over, or in over his or her head, or any medical professional overstepping his or her bounds. These all happen to us, 
and we both felt good about any changes we made happen or any complaints that we made that were heard. Don't be afraid to speak up. Two, we all want doctors to know everything and to be able to fix it. This is never going to happen. They do their best, and that's all we can hope for. Three, not everyone in your family or community is going to be helpful. We were very lucky that our family was so supportive and loving. There were a really very few friends who either disappeared or were so unhelpful that we just severed contact. We found that we did not really want people, people's advice, just love and support. A mantra that I learned and try to live by, just this, don't know, present moment, only moment. As you can intimate from these writings, we worked very hard at our relationships with the doctors, nurses, and other staff here at Stanford, and it paid off. The team approach that David has spoken about was not formalized when we were here, but it does sound like what we were moving towards and, and I think how we related with the staff here at, at Stanford. Now I think it's time to open it up for questions. Thank you. Best doctor ever. Very be happy. Yes. Well, this is your part. <laughs> sure, right here. What percentage of patients that will be cured just by chemotherapy without transplant? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. It's very specific to what disease the patient has. And um, we can't really. Um, give you a number. I mean, uh, again, I'm going to speak uh, from the hematopoietic blood cancers. She, you need to repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, the question was, uh, uh, Dr. Miklos, uh, what percent of patients with cancer can be cured with chemotherapy alone? And um, what I'm saying again is it's uh, highly variable. So we're, I'm going to say to you, most people have really good options in some diseases. So um, let's be clear. Hodgkin's disease, a disease that happens 25,000 newly diagnosed patients a year. 85% of these people will be cured using a single type of chemotherapy called ABVD done over about four months' time. And the other 15% have numerous new therapies that we hope to be able to bring more and more people into uh, a cure, but it doesn't happen for all of them. Uh, the problem that I've been speaking about today, the CAR T cells that are coming on the horizon, treating patients with diffuse large cell lymphoma, 40,000 patients in America, uh, 1,500 people in the Bay Area diagnosed every year, and two-thirds of those people really will get uh, cured going through chemotherapy, but that still means that there are um, 500 people that want to come to Stanford tomorrow for uh, CAR therapy. And, and it's uh, going to change based on what the disease situation is. And so there's no simple answer. The, the good news is it's increasing every day that new therapies with less toxicity, more targeted therapies designed because we understand what causes the cancer, imatinib being that wonder drug that happened back in 1998, uh, able to cure chronic myelogenous leukemia with taking a pill once a day, a drug that Barry would have benefited from uh, called abrutinib, made by Pharmacyclics down Sunnyvale and started in 2009, FDA approved in 2014, treating CLL. Treating, which is what Barry had, treating marginal cell lymphoma, treating mantle cell lymphoma. Again, this is a drug that now 60,000 people are taking uh, every day, a pill once a day. And for many people, that really will be all they'll need. So um, no simple answer. Getting better every day. And then there's always people who have challenging diseases that we, uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't seem to run out of jobs. Please. Another question I have, I was often heard uh, about the target drug therapy. Sure. It's target specific gene mutation. Does it happen in hem hematopoietic uh, cancer situation? Sure. So the question was, uh, what about these targeted therapies? Uh, you know, my doctor wants to run a panel of 50 uh, different gene mutations because maybe there's a druggable target. And there certainly have been druggable targets identified. 
uh, epidermal growth factor receptor mutations in patients with lung cancer has dramatically changed their treatments and medicines that are pills that uh, interact with that uh, single target that's overexpressed in the cancer cell can shut it off. These are frequently called uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and the toxicity of the tyrosine kinase inhibitor is uh, mild compared to nausea, vomiting, low blood counts. And, but the tyrosine kinase inhibitors even have side effects. Ask your friends, uh, cramps, nausea, fatigue. Um, it's, even those pills have side effects. So um, we hope that uh, the information that comes from doing some of this uh, next generation sequencing analysis of the cancer will um, make more and more druggable targets evident. I'm kind of the wrong person to ask that question. My friend Joel Neal, some of the lung cancer, breast cancer patient doctors would have a little bit more to discuss how that's really changed um, therapy. Herceptin is a monoclonal antibody in breast cancer. It has a tremendous role. Um, and in general, uh, fortunately, many women with breast cancer, many men with prostate cancer. I mean, Barry was right, right? The prostate cancer uh, was not the thing that uh, was going to do him in my own stepfather, uh, my own uh, um, father-in-law just died after battling prostate cancer, but he died of a heart attack. So, you know, and he was 87 and he was a happy man. Um, nope, you're gonna have to wait now. Let's see if anybody else wants to ask a question. In the back. I have a question regarding Sure. Um, well, patients are always going to participate. Um, the key question is the, what is the uh, real, again, distinguish autologous transplantation, where you're using the patient's own stem cells, from the allogeneic transplant, where you're using stem cells and immunity from somebody who's histocompatible. Um, so if you have a damaged stem cell in the very first place, if the, the one cell that grows into white cells, red cells, and platelets is genetically damaged, going back to this idea of finding mutations, and we can do this, then you can't really use your own stem cells. They are flawed, and the solution to that is to replace the stem cell. This is really the number one indication for allogeneic transplantation, and this is what happens most frequently in patients who have myelodysplastic syndrome, bone marrow failures, aplastic anemia, um, and acute myeloid leukemia. So those patients where moving from the seed to a, a mature white blood cell, a neutrophil, takes seven days, um, that is a problem if the seed is damaged. Uh, in contrast, if you're uh, going to talk about uh, the lymphocytes, the lymphomas, where those uh, were maybe even generated when you were a child, and yet they acquired some genetic damage living in a tough world uh, years later, and now they are years out from that seed then you actually have this option of taking the seed that's not genetically damaged, put it in the freezer, and then come back, give high doses of chemotherapy, rescue the blood production by allowing the seed to grow again in about 12 days. And you're right, compared to the risks and the infectious complications of the allogeneic transplant, uh, that is far better. Um, but it's not really a choice for the patient per se, much as uh, what is the appropriate therapy for the disease that the patient presents with. There, there, there's very few situations where you really have a choice that they're equally effective uh, therapies. Those are really two different therapies. That's really what I tried to highlight when I kept going over the differences between an auto and an allo. One is just high dose chemotherapy and one is really an immunological therapy. Uh, a CAR T cell therapy, again, I'm trying to get you on this idea that there's something new coming, is really the immune therapy, uh, like an allogenic transplant, but it's only targeting one target, maybe two, the way we're doing it right now. So two targets, not 25,000 genes, not everything in the world, not what's going to cause graft-versus-host disease, just a good target that's on the surface of the cancer cell. And we put in an immunological T cell that goes from 2 million on day one to 20 billion, four logs higher, seven days later. So where it took um, years to grow Barry's immune system again, these CAR T cells that are genetically modified, that are being driven by promoters that we never understood 15 years ago, are um, explosive, um, uh, dramatic, uh, powerful therapies occurring in a week. And uh, of course, uh, that comes with a little bit of side effects and risks that we're learning more about because, again, uh, the first uh, uh, approval for these drugs occurred uh, three months ago. Yes. 
All right. So in order to do the CAR T cell experiment, I mean studies, you have to identify the patient's defect, right? No. No, we have to um, know that there's a target on the cancer itself, which would be um, bindable, which would be, oh, okay. Um, okay. so you, we don't have to know that there's a single point mutation in the cell surface protein. Right. We just have to know that that surface protein is expressed on the cancer and not on the normal tissues of the body. So it's really important. The hard part about CAR therapy, just to get to the punchline, is uh, it's effective when there's a tumor that is uh, highly expressed only on the cancer and on no other tissues in the body mm -hmm. because it's going to wipe out everything that's expressing the target. And the targets for the CAR therapies right now are CD19. It's a target that's on B lymphocytes, uh, so uh, children who have the acute leukemias and adults who have these um, B cell malignancies express this target. Right, can I sure can. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. No, but the question these are great questions. Yeah. The question is, you know that lung cancer and breast cancer, you could do target therapy, but not, not too much in the hematopoietic cells in the situation. I think it's because too diverse, because the cell, the changes, mutations are too diverse or, or just too hard to target. So we are giving immune therapies to patients with lung cancer, yes. sarcoma, cervical cancers today at Stanford. Uh, it is... Um, not proven what the expectation is. It is um, based on molecules that are highly expressed in cancer cells, but these molecules that are called tumor antigens are actually on the inside of the cell. They're in the cytosol. They're floating around inside. And they have to use the histocompatibility. They have to use that MHC, that scaffolding protein, to be presented up on the surface where then cell, the immune cells can come and target. Now, this isn't that different than chickenpox, okay? I just want to make it real simple, right? This is like, you all had chickenpox, I had chickenpox, we all have chickenpox. My kids got vaccinated, they're not going to have chickenpox. Oh, heck, they're going to have chickenpox over and over again, but it's going to come later. Okay, so as a chickenpox carrier, uh, who's uh, got disease today? Right, but uh, who has uh, varicella zoster virus? Right, we all have it, right? It's in our backs, it's in our dorsal root ganglia, and every once in a while it comes out as something called shingles or, or um, zoster, and it's very painful for some people. Okay, so um, there's an effective immune response. It lasts a lifetime. 85% uh, of us will never have it recur. Boy, if we could do that for cancer, wouldn't that be amazing? So that's the idea. Can you build an immune response against the cancer that is targeted just for the cancer and will last a lifetime? And an allogeneic transplant is the kitchen sink approach. We don't know what the target is, but we can put in the whole immune system targeting everything about that patient. And the CAR therapy right now with just one target is the uh, uh, extreme opposite, right? One target, one cell. And, and, and I will tell you that when the patients are failing in the CAR therapy right now, the cancer that had billions of cells in that tumor mass that was only this big, uh, some, one, two, ten, I don't know how many, didn't express the target. So when they didn't express the target, they escaped that immune response. And while there were only 10 of them there last month, the uh, next month there's thousands, then hundreds of thousands, and then it's a relapse at three or four months. And, um, and that's the bugaboo right now. We're working on that. So uh, again, uh, I know that I'm a car salesman. <laughs> um, I get told this a few times a day, OK? And I, <laughs> Um, and I did enroll two people onto clinical trials today, okay, because clinical trials are how we learn, and uh, this is how we move forward, and it's a partnership, again, to learn together, keep score, bring new therapies forward, okay? Um, so uh, we at Stanford have the first CAR that actually targets two molecules on one single protein on the surface of the cell, and we've treated six patients. Um, and the sixth patient uh, came in today a little sick, so I'm gonna go back after I finish here and make sure that everything's okay, because she's supposed to get her cells on Friday, so I have to make sure that's gonna work, okay? Um, it's a big responsibility, and you can imagine the first guy, uh, he looked at me and said, is it gonna work? And I was like, well, you know I don't know. And <laughs> uh, but it, it kills the cells in the tube. It killed the cell in the mouse. I can count the cells. They expand. They, you know, this should work. And here's the deal. I'm going to uh, measure every single time I see you weekly, and we're going to show you how many cars you have. And if it persists, um, we're going to feel good about this. Now, 
Um, some of you may have met him. We did a commercial back in October. We talked to with, um, you know, Channel uh, 8, Channel 4. We did Fox. We did a couple different uh, news breaks. And, um, and my friend died, okay? He died ultimately around 60 days of tumor progression. And um, uh, he's, we're all sad. He's, uh, he was a wonderful man. But uh, the second patient has a complete response. And this is the way it is. It's like the guy who did the bone marrow transplants in 1959 to 1969. And you're uh, looking the guy in the eye and you say, well, what do you mean you want to know how the first 19 did? And you have to tell him. And, you know, this is a very honest relationship. Um, and, you know, where we are today, if Barry was with us, uh, he would have gotten a drug called a Brutinib, which is a pill you take once a day made down the street. And um, I don't know how long it would have worked, but it would have been a pill that he would have taken. And maybe in combination with Venataclax, now on clinical trials showing dramatic responses. Uh, around 2008, we uh, developed a high-throughput sequence, sequencing technology to be able to measure the cancer that we started to apply to Barry just as we were getting into the 2013 range. It's a company that now we've commercialized. I have no stake. I make no money on this, but this is how you know things come forward. So now we can measure the cancer with a sensitivity of one in a million, and that changes everything, right? I mean, if you can measure cancer, you can actually see what's going on. Many of you have seen CAT scans. You say, I can measure the cancer. Well, it's not quite the same thing. Um, and so that's a dramatic response. And this abrutinib drug actually was, um, it is the only FDA-approved therapy for that chronic graft-versus-host disease. Oh. And we learned that because two of my other patients with CLL went on the phase one trial in 2009. And when they got the drug, not only did they um, have their CLL go away, the donor chimerism became 100%, the donor took over. Oh. And the GVHD went away. And I went to the company with just pictures. I just said, you know, this is what happened. Just, I know you guys don't know this is what happened, but this is what happened. And, uh, and they're like, wow. So um, they said, well, you have to wait till we get this FDA approved, and then we're going to test it in chronic GVHD. And they held firm to their word. So in 2013, it was FDA approved. In 2014, we started doing the studies. And the FDA approval for abrutinib as the only treatment for graft-versus-host disease uh, happened in August of this year. And so um, it's been a wild ride. Uh, we are learning because of partnerships, measurements, putting people on trial and committing to them that I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm with you. And um, I, I hope that you and Barry always felt that way. Absolutely. Because I, I do get told I'm, I, am, I am a car salesman. That was in the very beginning. <laughs> And you sold us a pretty good car. <laughs> but it's not just me, okay? This is the Stanford commitment. This is what distinguishes um, Palo Alto, you know, any hospital in the world from a university tertiary care referral center. And, you know, sometimes we have less parking and sometimes the doctors keep you waiting and sometimes uh, we draw a little more blood samples because you're on research studies. And, and that's all true. Um, but uh, the commitment and the ability to bring the new therapy and to know that you have one of these in your backyard. It's the same as having a good school system, a good fireman down the street, a police department that you're proud of, and you have Stanford. And, and that's our commitment to you. This is really, um, I hope you realize this is something that should be prized. I, I worked at Dana-Farber in Boston for uh, 10 years before this, and they have a wonderful commitment, the Jimmy Fund and the community build there. And uh, it goes back many, many more years than what we have in California at this point. But Stanford's committed to building that community relationship. And um, uh, it's a treasure. I mean, it really, uh, I, I can't imagine how much um, has happened uh, here. And UCSF is a treasure, and, and, uh, and Harvard's a treasure. I mean, these are, you know, city of hope. These are wonderful things. We want to nurture them. Um, we're lucky we have them. Yeah, please. More questions. Uh, this is a little bit about the psychological part of it. Great, I'm going to give that to Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, for the patient and the caregiver. Your description is that there's a constant advance of medications and treatments, and you're sick, and you have this feeling that it's not going to reach you in time, that, you know, you know it's coming, but you're not. Um, and I just wonder how you approach that, the fact that, you know, if you lived another year or two, you would have gotten this new drug, but you didn't. Um, so I, I just want, I mean, maybe there's no real answer to that, but how do you handle that? And how do you handle that as a caregiver and as a 
doctor. Okay, so the question is, how do you handle knowing that things are coming along and you're maybe not gonna survive to, to get them? Well, Barry and I both looked on it as we were getting the best we could at the time. And we had no regrets. And even now hearing about these wonderful therapies, you know, it just wasn't happening for us then. So I, I don't, I still don't feel what if, because it's just what happened. And we had the best care possible here and we had great communication with everyone and that was more important than, than the what ifs. Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely true. And Barry died when in 2014? February 1st. The drug that we discussed was approved on Valentine's of 2014. Uh -huh. So, you know, you want to talk about close, but no cigar. February 1st, yeah. Now, you know, I, I don't know if that would have done the trick, but I mean, it doesn't get any more close than that. And you could say, wow. Um, you know, I haven't been challenged with that mortality aspect. I feel like I'm getting old, but I haven't been challenged with that. I, however, um, I have a great friend, uh, another friend, many friends, um, and he wouldn't mind if I told uh, his name, Carl Grumet. Carl um, was the director of the blood transfusion program at Stanford. He invented uh, much of the technology for how we determine histocompatibility back in 1970. He's a, a real mensch, uh, a, a wonderful, I, I thought he was a good uh, scientist, uh, He's even a better person, and um, he has a wonderful family, and he has supported my career, and Carl had my uh, back. He came to my lab and he gave me a lot of great ideas. Well, Carl had diffuse large cell lymphoma, the damn thing that I am so focused on, and it came in 19, uh, it came three times, and it came uh, eight years apart, so 90s, and then 2004, and then again, he died about a year and a half ago. And when it came back the last time, it was before we had these, car about two years ago, right? Again, before the CAR-T. And, um, you know, it's really depressing. But uh, Carl also knew when to draw the line. And uh, he did one cycle of chemo. The third time it came back, we were down in F ground talking, his wife and I, and uh, Carl. And uh, he had it in his brain, so he was a little confused. And uh, not, he wasn't confused. He was not able to speak clearly. But, uh, you know, give me the straight answer. Is this going to fix me? No. Okay, I'm going home. And so he held court in his uh, kitchen for the next uh, 30 days. And then he died, and his family um, valued that 30 days. And that's what we're talking about, knowing what the goals are, what is the appropriate quality of life, how to spend time, making sure someone tells you when it's time to make new decisions, to redirect your goals of care, to um, have an honest conversation, to have the spiritual strength that... You know, Carl was never afraid. I mean, man lived a life that, you know, we all try to. And um, he's really a remarkable guy. I mean, um, just a, a great mentor, a great mensch. So, you know, those are, uh, those are real life stories, right? These guys came close and they didn't get it. And, uh, you know, so you say, what do I do about it? I got to bet every morning I work hard. Yeah. My wife wants to know where the heck I am tonight. I mean, like, <laughs> and, and the page that's coming through right now, I just got one for um, how am I going to get a budget for a clinical trial through the uh, contracts office. And, you know, you may think it's all about science and medicine. There's a lot of logistics involved in this. So I'm going to answer that page, and we're going to get this trial open in two weeks, okay? So that's, that's what we do. Well, I think I'll